All right. I'm going to go ahead and get started for everybody who's joining us. Um, thanks so much for joining for the Reading Africa uh, African Film and Literary Panel. We're really excited about it. Um, I'm with Catalyst Press. I'm the South African Office Head for Catalyst Press. We've also got our publisher, Jessica Powers, with us, and our publicist, Ashanta Jackson, are joining. Um, and we are an indie publisher of African books. And once a year, we host our big um, week-long Reading Africa celebration of all things African literature, writers, publishers, magazines, um, everything of the sort. So, um, and we've now added in some virtual events. This is one of them. We're really excited about it, and we're grateful that you're all joining us. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to quickly pass it along to Onyeka, my co-host at James Curry Society, um, just to give a brief little introduction, and then we'll pass it along to Stephen for moderation. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everywhere. Um, thank you, Sarah, for organizing this. And... Uh, I'm, I'm grateful that you thought of the James Curry Society for this kind of uh, conversation. I would like to tell you a bit about the James Curry Society, which is important. Um, James Curry uh, co-founded African Writer Series with Chino Achebe in the 60s, and uh, he has been promoting African studies, politics, and culture for a long time. He's still alive, 85 years old. Uh, his main dream was to have uh, the promotion of African culture continue. And it was uh, pertinent that I, I mean, I thought, I thought I'm, I'm the crown prince of African studies uh, promotion or, or empire. So I thought it's important to uh, continue the promotion of uh, African culture in Oxford. And that is why we are based in Oxford. Um, we promote films, we promote books, we promote uh, uh, cultural events uh, like the James Curry Literary Festival. Uh, we also have uh, the Af uh, Oxford Afro-Caribbean Film Festival, which is coming up next year. Um, and uh, the James Curry inaugural fellow, Stephen Ebonton, who's going to uh, moderate this conversation, as a filmmaker himself and a speculative fiction writer, uh, which is more of entertainment to all of us. Uh, we call it uh, fantasy, science fiction. We sort of bundle them up. And it's uh, good that Stephen will continue the conversation with us because he's more experienced. Like I told Sarah, I'd say Stephen is smart and more brilliant than me. And this has nothing to do with modesty because I'm not modest. So, um, Stephen, please carry on. Thanks, Anjika. Yeah, uh, just thanks to Catalyst Press for um, organizing this and the James Curry Society for getting the, the panelists that we've got tonight, today. Um, so the audience members, you'll see that you can type into the Q&A. So uh, while we're chatting, I'll just keep on checking on that to have some kind of uh, Q&A towards the end. And depending on how we go and all the avenues that we go through tonight, um, we'll see if we get to questions. Um, so yeah, and also for, for any of the guests, if we're talking about anything and you want to just add in, just raise your hand and we can keep it going. Um, so it, all the, with all the guests that are, are here tonight, um, they I've had the pleasure of engaging in some item of their content over the last couple of years. Um, and so it's it's uh, an absolute pleasure to to be hosting them tonight to discuss their points of view. Um, the unique skills and experiences that they've all got um, over the years, I think, is going to add to quite an interesting conversation. Um, some of them from uh, different uh, areas within literary filmmaking, etc. So um, it's just going to be some uh, interesting crossovers. So we are discussing African. Uh, filmmaking and adaptation of, of literary works into to films. 
um, we're going to uh, just chat about what the uh, particularly the last few years has has meant in terms of the changing landscape. Some of us have been involved in these industries since the 90s. Um, and, you know, so those perspectives on what's shifted, why it's shifted is going to be quite interesting to, to chat about. Um, I think the, the key thing that is important in this discussion and from the points of view that we, we've got is that we are African creators. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to be telling our stories um, and for uh what hasn't been necessarily the first time in history you know we've we've had the western gaze uh, looking upon us but you know those have kind of come in waves and onyeka mentioned the african writers series as one of those bodies of work that started in the 50s and 60s where you know african voices were heard for what seemed like the first time globally you know we've been telling our stories all along on the continent uh, so, you know, that that focus comes to us every now and again, and, and now it's uh, kind of uh, more instantaneous. So when we talk about the, the written work and adaptations, we including things like novels, short stories, plays, uh, scripts, you know, screenwriting, uh, graphic novel, script writing. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the gamut that we're going to talk about today. Um, for a background on myself, uh, my name is Stephen Hamilton and I am in Oxford. I'm a South African. I've been here since January uh, as the James Curry Fellow to the University of Oxford. My background is graphic design, illustration, filmmaking, and writing novels and short stories. And I'm part of the Saudi Collective. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction of the, the five guests that we've got uh, this evening. Uh, going in alphabetical order, we've got Anthony Silverston. He's uh, partner and head of development at uh, Triggerfish Animation Studios. Um, you know, uh, coming up in the design world, Triggerfish is pretty much a household name in in South Africa in terms of uh, production and the uh, you know the international quality of work that they've produced. Uh, Anthony is involved in directing and script writing. He oversees project development. Uh, and works with the likes of Disney, Netflix, and uh, other partners. Then there's uh, Aoife Lennon Ritchie from Cape Town. Uh, she is a, an Irish uh, writer and literary agent and owner of the uh, Lennon Ritchie Agency, um, as well as a film talent uh, agent. Uh, so uh, it'll be interesting to get her perspective on kind of both sides of you know the literary and film filmmaking. Um, uh, landscape. Then uh, Jenna Kata Bass, um, a South African film director, photographer and writer. She's written short stories under the, um, the name of Constance Marburg, one of which uh, was a short story a short uh, on the short list for the Kane Prize in 2012. Um, and she's also a founder of uh, Jungle Gym. Uh, magazine, which I've got a couple of issues, which I have yet to trim the edges to read. <laughs> so, um, yeah, fantastic publication of uh, mainly genre fiction. Um, then Onyeka Nwelewe, who did the introduction there. Uh, Prof is a Nigerian filmmaker, having produced and directed feature films, documentaries, and uh, music videos. He is a publisher, talk show host, and an author of uh, around 21 books um, so it will be good it'd be good to get his insights uh, also from a literary point of view and from a filmmaking point of view uh, and I'll add he is both the academic visitor to the University of Oxford and the uh, University of Cambridge um, and he's a dean of uh, for the um, School of Cinematic uh, Studies at uh, Queensland and Haiti then, amongst other things, then Shafela Koka, an award-winning uh, illustrator, art director, born and raised in Lagos, uh, where I've just been, <laughs> and uh, yeah, working with the likes of Triggerfish, um, Disney, and Sony, um, he kick-started and published a graphic novel called uh, Outcasts of Jupiter, of which I bought a copy in 2017. <laughs> Just loved the artwork. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, uh, illustration style, um, I know you've just released uh, a follow-up to that called New Masters in 2022. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot to, to talk about. Um, and then hopefully we can catch up at the end and just see what everybody's working on and what's in the works. So um, just to... Just to get into it uh, now, um, fairly generally, um, as I as I mentioned, you know, we've we've come into this this phase where we're in a streaming age. Um, we've had these kind of uh, fluctuations of interest from uh, the global community, whether it's producers and studios. Uh, in the past, um, you know, publishing houses doing the traditional publishing. So we very much in a in a prime age of content creation. I think there's been a shift towards more African content, which I just want to get everybody's point of view on that and how that affects you individually, your industries that you work in day to day. Um, I think for anybody listening, particularly people wanting to come into those industries, just seeing what what the uh, opportunities are there, uh, some honest uh, dialogue about the realities of it. Um, you know, nobody's going to get get rich overnight and, you know, you, know, you need to work at the talents that, that are on display here. So, um, yeah, I think that that kind of gets us started. Um, um, okay, so I'll go to I'll go to Onyeka. Onyeka, um, with your with your publishing uh, business, your twenty one books that you've published yourself, um, and your filmmaking, you also bridge that uh, that divide between the the industries, and maybe you can just share some insights into. Uh, what you're seeing and and uh, the the current landscape out there. I made a post on my socials few days ago about not waiting for people to do things for me. Uh, my my I'm, I adopted one of my books into a film myself because I I mean, for how long will I wait for someone to have interest in my work? My encouragement is for people who have literary works that they think. Um, literary works that speak to them and they would like them on screen to do the job. I mean, having this conversation about adaptation. What I also did was to adapt the book into an Igbo film so that the people who live in the same place where the book is set could uh, connect with the story in their language and not in English. Uh, most films you see made for, uh, in Nollywood are done in English, right? And you see the actors not being able to express themselves because they are acting out in foreign language. Uh, the best films you can ever find anywhere are those made in a language that the actor speaks. Um, and I, I, I also think that um, writers should Writers who are filmmakers should continue to make it easy for readers translating from the book to the screen. That way it's easy for people who say they don't read. Uh, we shouldn't, we should sometimes ignore that part where they say, oh, the, the book is better than the film. There are different formats and they take different uh, measures to make. It's not the same energy that you use in making, um, in writing a book that you use in making a film. Uh, I wouldn't like to digress much, but um, conversations around adaptations from books to film, from film to books, they should happen. They call it, it's called novelization. Um, I also, I think I have a book, I have, I have already novelized uh, the Strangers of Brian Fontaine. It was written first as a screenplay before it was written as a novel. Uh, even though it's not been on screen, but I, I, I took it from a screenplay and put it, in, novelized it because the, the people I went to to get funding for the film stopped answering my emails, responding to them. 
So I thought to myself, maybe it's time to move on to better things. Um, I have nothing much to add, but that um, different platforms should be adapted onto different uh, met into different methods to be able to tell stories and uh, continue to encourage the promotion of the arts. Great. Yeah, and I think also one of the areas that you touched on is is language, and particularly with now with streaming, a lot of people are a little bit more used to reading close captioning or subtitles in the language that they prefer, so that you know film is done in its original language, and that from for a filmmaker uh, is is a lot truer to the original source, and you know I think also. For writers, I know Ngugi Wationgo is, is working on, on encouraging writers to write in their languages, uh, no matter where it might end up getting published, you know, it can get translated. So Aoife, I, just to go back to yourself and the, that, can you hear me? that, uh, can you hear me? yes, Yay. yes, you can. Okay, <laughs> Great. Lovely to be yeah, here. So lovely to see you all. Thank you for including me. Um, just on that, what you were saying about people are used to watching things in different languages now, I think uh, COVID actually um, was very useful there because when COVID started, production stopped everywhere and uh, broadcasters around the world were running low on content. So they started using the programs and the features that they had under license from other countries and they realized People don't mind subtitles or funny accents or weird clothes or different colored faces. And in fact, people are really responding to these international stories from international writers. So COVID actually opened the world up in, in, a, in a wonderful way, even while we're all hunkered down at home. And from my point of view, I'm really seeing an explosion in um, an appetite for stories from here, from Africa, from South Africa and a real interest in seeing who's coming up and who's saying what and how are they saying it. So it's a really exciting time to be working with African and South African writers and directors and novelists. Um, and yes, I mean, I think now there's a great opportunity for people to really tell the story they've always wanted to tell. And do you find there's certain types of stories that um, may be more accessible for international audiences or publishers, or is it fairly broad at the moment? It's very broad. I mean, you know, from literary fiction, like we've got a wonderful novelist published by Jessica Sikiwen Glovu. I mean, she's exploded around the world and she's quite a literary writer. She's winning all the prizes in South Africa, but people are really starting to wake up to her overseas. And on the other side, then you've got very commercial writers like Angela McCulloch or Gail Schimmel who are writing psychological thriller or women's commercial fiction. And they're also getting a huge audience around the world. And crime is always, it's, there's always a market for crime. People always want to read crime and watch it, but really there isn't a single genre that people aren't keen to see and to read and to watch. Great. Uh, Jenna, um, just in terms of your uh, filmmaking and, and uh, literary works, um, uh, are there things that that uh, you found, um, you know, working with other creators in in the industry that that you feel um, kind of have changed over the last few years? Uh, it definitely has. Um, I I guess. I tend to take a bit more of a cynical view, which I always like kind of, I guess, I feel like I need to like moderate given the circumstances. I don't know how like how dark to get about it. But um as dark as yeah, you need to I, get. I think, no, I mean no, it's it, it never really needs to go there, I don't think. Um, at least not on a webinar. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think for me, I feel like there is the bare like now at this point where I think a lot of people are you know very um enthusiastic about the level of interest that there is now in African fiction and storytelling more generally for me I feel like it's the bare minimum and it kind of comes at the cost of like centuries decades of of being ignored um and and I guess I'm not I mean I'm not speaking about myself really as a white South African but I guess the continent more broadly and uh 
I just feel like it's like the least that the world can do at this point is to like take the interest that it is. Um, and it's also in the world's like interest, I think, um, you know, to um, to take an interest in what's going on in the whole continent. So, yeah, I, that has changed. Whereas I think, you know, when I start when I was at um, film school and kind of graduating and kind of expecting to be, you know, just kind of go into the film industry and be able to do whatever I wanted, I quickly realized that that wasn't the case and Hollywood didn't care at all. Um, about what I had to do or say, you know, and um, I think that has now changed, but I still think that there's, you know, it's a new set of gatekeepers and there are still a lot of obstacles to entry. And uh, there's also a new set of what counts as African storytelling, what counts as African enough and what counts as, um, you know, a palatable version. And I think that's also changed. There was a certain set of rules and those are now different and maybe more broader, but they're still there. Um, so things have definitely changed. But um, I think there's still a lot of boundaries that remain kind of available to be pushed, I think. Yeah, and also I think there, there might be a, a misconception with uh, creators, uh, particularly people coming into the industry that, you know, you just get on the phone or email with Netflix and say, well, what do you want? And we'll deliver it. You know, they, you, you've got to actually be the creator, be the initiator, and then start pushing it out to those those studios to actually find out what it is that they're they're interested in. Um, so then to Shafela and, and Anthony, um, uh, within the, the arenas that you guys work, um, Shafela, uh, from a comics point of view, um, I'm sure you probably know the the likes of Unique Studios. Um, they've they've just had Yanyu picked up um, by HBO Max uh, Cartoon Network, and they signed a twenty book deal with Dark Horse Comics, which is which is quite quite a substantial uh, something quite substantial for a, a, a group that have been around for a few years and they've they've done their their hard work. But um, I just wanted to get your point of view and, and what you've seen um, over the last couple of years uh, since you've gone into that industry in particular um you've obviously done you know from uh 2d art going into animated and and, and that side of things so yeah from both of you where, where do you how do you see it's changed anthony a bit more years on the clock but i'd be interested to just get your point of view from you know early days uh trigger fish so shafele yeah yeah and thank you Stephen. uh it's I think I'm a little bit of an outlier because uh, you just used Unique Studios as an example. Um, you know, Royal Coupe, he had his own uh, comic book studio that he essentially published a whole bunch of books with and then uh, partnered with Dark Horse to uh, both republish and also um, bring out new books with. Um, from my experience with working in comics, uh, I've done a book or two books now with my brother. Uh, one of them has been kickstarted and one of them has been published by uh, Image Comics, which is a publishing studio or publishing house in, in the States here. And, you know, um, I say I'm an outlier because I mostly work in animation. Um, and that's my method of telling stories primarily. Uh, comics is just a long standing love. And I think one thing that um, I know about most Nigerian publishing in terms of the, the industry is that uh it's there but it's not where it needs to be and that's why usually you see uh studios like unique partnering with a dark horse for instance um to get their comics into a wider scope of an audience um and and i think that's the, the shame for me is that uh the industry in nigeria itself is not built up enough um to the point where you be able to reach indigenous audiences um so i think the crossover is wonderful and I'm glad I'm glad that bridge exists. Uh, you know, of course, my brother and I are very uh, happy to work with Image uh, on New Masters, which is our book that just came out this year. Um, but I think, you know, my my early days in my career, uh, I was desperately looking for to work on on African stories. You know, I worked in studios like Sony and Activision as a designer, as an illustrator, um, and this the the IP that we worked on was you know it was fun to work on. Um, but it had nothing to do with the stories I grew up with or things that I was potentially interested in working in long term. Um, so 
you know, that's essentially what drove me to work in comics with my brother was this desire to create a niche and possibly eventually, you know, get that back to Nigeria in a way. And we're, we're sort of taking the long way around, I guess, uh, by, by going through image and then hopefully eventually publishing in Nigeria and uh, who knows what would happen for, with new masters as an IP from there. Um, but I think, you know, like Jenna, I'm a little bit, uh, no, I wouldn't say I'm cynical. I would say I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about the, the new, I, it's not new anymore. It's probably like five to 10 years old by now, this, this new desire to consume African stories. Um, but I do have this, uh, this nagging sense in the back of my head or, or hope that people don't get exploited because essentially all of us are, uh, you know, we're green in, in terms of their eyes, in terms of Western eyes. Um, and the hope is that we don't get exploited or, um, or that this gaze that uh, you were just talking about, Stephen, doesn't impede the way we tell our stories, right? But I think in particular, I'm, I'm thinking about the economics and how we navigate that. And I think that's something more and more I've been confronted with in the last couple of years that um, I'm hoping to be enlightened by this audience, actually, or sorry, not this audience, but this, uh, this crew of people that are a little bit more experienced than I am, actually. Well, if I may, that, uh, that oh. can be that can be where an agent can help. I mean, not just us, but there are agents around the world now who are really advocating for and um, looking out for for writers from here, writers and directors from here. So, um, I'm a writer and uh, I'm an agent, but I have an agent. You know, so um, I really think it's very important for people to be represented by someone who isn't themselves and someone who has experience and contacts and. I absolutely agree with you that it's really important that people aren't exploited. And I think people have been for a very long time. So that's something that we at Fortwood and the Lemon Ritchie Agency really make it our life's work to make sure that people are well represented and well advocated for. Yeah, and I think also with my work with the African Speculative Fiction Society, that's one thing that we have seen uh, over the last few years in terms of contracts. Um, you know, some of the uh, writers that are contributing to outside publications, I mean, outside the continent, um, and some of the contracts that they've been signing, you know, um, and we try and give them as much guidance as possible. But as Aoife said, you know, getting getting representation does does help that. Um, so, uh, Anthony, just in terms of yeah. of your of your insights in in how yeah. things have have kind of shifted. Um, uh, I think also what Shafela just touched on as well, just in terms of, you know, making sure that, I mean, making sure it's up to the in individual, but, you know, the a tendency to try and craft stories to mm -hmm. to a an end studio or producer or that kind of thing, rather than kind of telling your own stories. So what, what have you seen? Um, you know, as I said, Triggerfish has been around since the 90s. So, you know, you've seen it all. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack, um, and a lot of people have touched on a lot of different things that I could already talk a lot about. Um, I think, like, it. I definitely do feel cautiously optimistic because because it just being in the industry when we were trying to pitch our original properties to the world, Africa was just this foreign concept. It just didn't. There was no precedent, so it was just really difficult. Um, to say that there was an audience um, to just, yeah, it, it, it felt almost impossible until we'd proven ourselves. And so in that sense, I feel like we've already done some of that hard work and now people are more receptive to it. And then from the business side, you know, the success of Black Panther was like, oh, now actually these stories work and they can be a success. So it's like, well, obviously, so now the challenge is like like Joe was saying, how to not exploit that. And there are definitely people that are looking to Africa as the cash cow of like, oh, there's this infinite you know source of stories. Let's tap into that. And I think um, we just always, at least at Triggerfish, we're trying to make sure that um, that they're being told by the people who are representing that culture. You know, so it's 
it's it's an authentic it's coming from an authentic personal place and luckily this authenticity word is a like kind of a buzzword at the moment as well in the industry so i think the west are kind of also opening up to that like they can't just come in and take our stories and tell them there they actually have to come and tell them here and um so i definitely feel like there are a lot of people in those kind of high powered positions who we've worked with at least who are very open and receptive to doing it the right way um i think the challenge is still trying to figure out how to make those stories universally relatable still because um you know even today i was pitching a project where there was a concern that you know coming from the outside they don't know what's a stereotype or what's offensive or what's so so they're kind of looking to us to tell that story properly and to give it the right consideration and um so I think people are just nervous and they feel out of their depth. And that's where um, I guess it is hard being an individual because you don't have that kind of support that maybe a, a bigger studio or an agent has to kind of represent that with a bit more authority. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think um, one other thing I wanted to touch on was like, like, like you mentioned Roy and, 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 and his comics. And, you know, like it's an interesting case because when I look at those stories, like I, I feel like it's it's still kind of what's expected from a dark horse comic. It's just relocated. And that's what we're also now opening up to. The more African stories that get told, the more diversity there is within those stories. So previously, you know, like each project that came out of Africa had to bear this like responsibility of being the nigerian story or the zambian story or whatever and now the more that they are the more that they can be this um yeah different perspectives and um i think that's that's very exciting people are, are seeing that those stereotypes um they, they 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 only because there weren't many stories told before and so there was that single story and um so yeah, I'm I'm kind of looking forward to yeah the the sort of precedent that the projects we're currently working on will set going forwards. Okay, um, I was going to ask Onyeka something, but he has disappeared. <laughs> um, okay, so just following on that, uh, you mentioned Black Panther, uh, and and this kind of goes to that point uh, uh, raised early on where um, we have these kind of waves of interest in African content and uh, so when you know the likes of Chinua Achebe and Wole Shenka were, were originally published in the 50s and 60s there was this great uh, kind of awakening from the rest of the world to the stories that were already happening in on the continent and uh you know we've we've gone through those kind of ups and downs and then you mentioned black panther and you know uh for good or bad you know what black panther did was actually show the outside world that there is an audience for those stories and i think most importantly that there's an audience on the continent who are willing to pay and consume that that content quite readily so the fact that it happened to be based on a comic book um was besides a point from a studio point of view. So um, Shafira, maybe you can speak to that just in terms of what that maybe did, um, you know, with with uh, outcasts of, of Jupiter at, at the time that you'd done or started the Kickstarter, where were you kind of in, in the Black Panther space? Uh, what was happening when, when that happened and, and did that have any kind of effect on um how you were made visible or not uh actually black panther came out after we released uh outcast of jupiter so it was after our kickstarter um okay. but you know at that time you could already tell that there was some interest in in that space you know right before we started this webinar we were just talking about kariba um and there's a few you know notable artists on the continent that produce work pretty regularly um that did spark a little bit of that uh, interest in the world. 
And um, so from our perspective, you know, when we self-published the book, um, we got quite a bit of interest. Um, but one eye-opening thing for my brother and I at the time was that, you know, comic books that, or publishing houses that wanted to partner with us, um, they obviously, you know, they publishing houses will always put suggestions forward for what you do with your work next. Um, and they were very interested in uh, essentially trying to get us to be more um, accessible, essentially, um, and you know, do things like tame, tame down the slang in the book, or or make suggestions as to whether or not we should um, maybe move the characters to a more African setting. Because the first book was was uh, set in Morocco, for instance, or a place that looked like Morocco. Um, so you know, my my brother and I set out to make this book because we wanted to tell a story that. Of course, that we first loved, but it was uh, it's a story about our lived experience and uh, about about the things that we enjoy from when we were growing up and and sort of the the amalgamation of all those things. So we were not interested in partnering with a studio that first of all probably didn't look out for our creative interests in that sense. Um, and also, uh, we were very, very careful not to partner with a story or a studio that um, shared the IP in terms of uh, ownership um, because it's a book that we wanted to work on our entire lives and that was very important to us to maintain that sense of um, of ownership of the book basically so um, yeah I think Black Panther you know in general it, it sparked a huge or you know I should say the the wave of interest uh, of, of work on the continent and from the the comics side of things you know um, I think for us, it, it just basically opened up an av a new avenue as to what the the book could um, could spark. You know, Black Panther was a comic as well, and it, it turned into this multi billion dollar franchise. Um, and my brother and I, for instance, when we published uh, New Masters, and even before that, with Outcast of Jupiter, we've been approached by a few people that want to adapt it into other uh, media as well. So. Um, you can see that essentially that's what Black Panther did is that it opened up people's appetites and ideas as to what they could do with with stories like this from from the continent. So um, again, it's another thing you're, you're cautiously optimistic about because uh, Black Panther works for a very specific reason. Um, and I think, um, you know, not every story can do what Black Panther did, essentially, and and that's one thing that my brother and I are very conscious about with our our work. So, yeah, great, uh, Jenna. Um, just in terms of um, you know the the films and and stories that are um, kind of in in our hands. Um, uh, I don't know if you've uh, had a chance to watch um, Bia Bandela's adaptation of the of death and the and, and the king's horseman um which came out on netflix recently but that is a, an adaptation of what Schwenker's play uh, from the 70s i think it was uh in terms of us actually taking the reins at that end of of the storytelling process and that kind of ownership of the stories um, we've also had, um, you know, the likes of Lauren Bukas uh, with The Shining Girls um, being a, a, adapted. Um, what What is your point of view in, in, in terms of what, how important that is in, in terms of us telling those stories rather than kind of plugging in an outside filmmaker into the process? Um. I mean, obviously, it's, I mean, it's definitely very important. Um, I th I still think, you know, there's, I don't, I don't necessarily think that having like a local filmmaker at the reins is like a magic kind of fix for the problem, because I think there's still, you know, as we all know, you know, make, making a film is a very collaborative um, process, but it's specifically going to be dictated by the people who have the most investment and what they want and what they feel their audience or their algorithm wants. Um, and so they depending on who that filmmaker is, there's going to be a lot of, you know, kind of 
potential compromises that they may have to make, even if they are, you know, on face value, you know, the the author of that story. So, I mean, it's it's wonderful to hear, you know, Chipala, how, you know, you kind of really stood up for, you know, maintaining the IP of your of your concept and your work, because I think that's something that very few people have the kind of courage to do a lot of the time when they're having those conversations. I think we're also always made to feel so grateful that we're even having the conversation or in the room with the right person that something small like sharing IP or taking the IP is you know it's not meant to be a big deal like you know what we're just creatives what what good is that for us you know so um and I think very few people even know that it's it's something that it can be protected and it's the ultimately like you know is that create that create I mean creative capital is such an overused term but like it is as much capital as the financial investment in the project and I think what we are seeing a lot of is um I work a lot with um, my co-writer, Babalwa Bartman, and like we've started calling it kind of creative mining because it's this ascent. I mean, I'm sure other people call it that too. It's not just us. But um, yeah, just this I, this way of, I think like with the scramble for Africa, um, you know, it kind of remind, it reminds me of that a little bit where there's this, this scramble for content um, and the kind of, the you, you see a lot of like everything, like a lot of things appear to be sort of like get rich quick schemes rather than like actual investments in the, you know, creative longevity of storytelling on the continent. And uh, Denise looks like he's laughing at me. Sorry, Anthony. <laughs> I think he's no, I agree. I agree. And other, and other, you've heard this from me before in other ways, I'm sure. But um, yeah, so anyway, yes, it is good. Um, but I don't. I think the outcome is not always, you know, this perfect scenario that we would hope for. I think there's still a lot of other kind of factors that like get thrown into the mix that can affect the authenticity or whatever that actually ends up meaning of, of what a story is. And um, also, you know, the, what is authenticity and who, whose story is it? And, you know, those conversations can get very like muddy quite quickly. And um, I think m many people who claim to be experts on that um, don't actually always know, you know, what makes something authentic or not. So, yeah, I think, um, I think we know it when we see it like that's it's one of those things and I think a lot of the time I'm told I should be seeing it but I don't see it so I enjoy you know authentic storytelling a lot but I still feel like I'd love to see more of it um yeah yeah because I think um I don't know about you guys but you know you almost look to um the individuals that do make a success as individuals uh, I, I mentioned lauren Bukas. obviously her work getting it adapted gives her a certain amount of clout uh, to be able to uh, influence uh, you know the decision makers and to make sure that the stories are getting told i mean uh, there's mention of you know stereotypes as an example even down to language, um, you know, making sure you've got the right language in a specific region for a setting. Um, but uh, what I wanted to uh, speak to Aoife about uh, and then bring it over to Anthony was um, the the RP, that that, that RP um, Shafela mentioned about, you know, making sure that you're not giving out, giving away too much to the outside organizations, whether it's the publishers, whether it's studios, um, and then as we, uh, you know, we're talking about individual individual creators here, and then uh, Anthony on Triggerfish's side as a as a, a, a an organization that to me has got clout in the industry. So um, yeah, if I just if what you can speak as as far as you know, guiding people um, as much as possible in in terms of what they they retain themselves. Yeah, well, it's super important. <laughs> it's very important. Um, number one, that you get credit for your work. I mean, I think often people give up their credit because they think that it's going to help them get it made. And once they agree to give it up, it's really impossible to get it back. You, you know, it's really hard. Um, and on the publishing side, the copyright always stays with the author. So they license the right to publish the work. But the, the work is still their, theirs. So um, a publisher will license particular rights. And so often a publisher will ask for all of the rights, including film rights and international rights and everything. And an author must ask, well, can you exploit all of those rights or should I be retaining some of them? And so that's where an agent comes in <laughs> again. <laughs> but if you don't have an agent, then it might be an idea to give your publisher 
world rights because then then maybe they have an agent and a lot of the good publishers including catalyst um have an agent who sell rights for them so it's not necessarily the right thing if you're um bringing a book to a publisher to hold on to rights um because unless you're gonna have somebody who can go out into the marketplace and exploit them for you and the tv and film side it's a little bit different so the contracts are quite different so in a publishing contract you put in everything that you're taking and in a film and tv contract you put in everything that you're not taking so everything is listed in a slightly different way um and on film and tv um when somebody comes and takes intellectual intellectual property ip like a book or a comic um you want to make sure that there's a time limit and that they have to do something with it within a period of time so you'd start off with a shopping agreement or an option and then they can extend that and then they can acquire the rights but if they don't make something then you should be able to get your rights back um so there's lots to consider and i do kind of think that it's not really your job your job is as a writer and a director is to create stuff and then preserve your creative relationship with your your producer and your publisher and hand over that to someone who can fight for you um, and can really advocate for you um, and who knows what to ask for and what not to ask for. But yes, Stephen, uh, Shazali, you're absolutely right. It's super, super important, both to hold on to um, the credit, importantly, and ownership of your work. So, Great. yeah, if I can add to all of that, because I think um, for us in animation, at least, um, you know, I, 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 I always see everything kind of like long, the long game animation is so slow and um i guess it's kind of you know with each deal that you make you can you're in a better position to make a better deal next time and you know so as an individual and as a studio company um i mean even lauren bukas as an example i mean she's she's an animation director herself but she wouldn't have directed the shining girls series like by getting an experienced director they had a lot more, you know, sway to get the, the investment they needed or the, you know, like, so, so, but now that The Shining Girls is done, there's a series based on her book and she's in a better position to negotiate a better deal going forwards. So, um, you know, we've, we've tried to improve each of our deals as our reputation builds. And that means that the creators who we are working with get a better deal Hopefully. And we've just recently turned down one because we we couldn't, the, the, you know, it depends on the partnership, the, the studio that we were talking to or, or partner, they just have their standard terms and deals and how much IP they're willing to give you. And you can just say no, like that's the other thing. It's not about giving it away. You just actually say you're not the right partner for me and try and find a different strategy. Um, so I think it's a choice, right? It's like, some people come with their terms and they're not negotiable. And it's like, if you're willing to accept those terms, then you're getting into a relationship on those terms. It doesn't mean they're bad. It means you must just make sure you're getting what you can out of it, which might be a really good first film, for example, like the current anthology we're working on with Shof, um for Disney. You know, we pitched the project to Disney and they went for it. They paid for all of the development. They paid for all the production. So they own everything. Like we own nothing. The creators own nothing. But we've been paid to do all of this work. And we're getting a really great project out of it. And I think everyone's reputation has grown. It builds precedent for the industry. It's like, yeah, who knows? So it's a case by case. I think some ideas, you know, you come up with on the spot and you're fine to kind of give that one away. Others are your like personal passion project that you've already invested a lot of time into. Keep that one, make the best deal. Um, I see Shop's hand is up. I don't know. Um, yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right about that, Anthony. You know, uh, for years and years working in the industry myself, a lot of the work you do is service-based for sure. Um, so it is about picking and choosing, um, at least from from my perspective, from the animation and uh, like I've done video games work in the past. Um, from from my from that perspective, you just have to kind of pick and choose which of your creative endeavors that you want to really protect. Um, 
But, you know, we're talking about adaptation and something I, I just wanted to briefly talk about was like this kind of um, sense of optimism I have because, uh, you know, when I was growing up, there were very few things that I saw in popular media that um, that told me that the, the place I was living in had value, basically. Like I, I would go to school and, and read books like, uh, you know, the, the Passport of Mao Emilia by Cipriana Quincy or even Death in the King's Horseman, like you just said, uh, Stephen. And, you know, I didn't see that reflected back to me through television or at comics. And as a young person, you know, I would see things like, uh, you know, Transformers and that type of thing, which, which had its own mythology. And it was all really cool to me, but it's all based on mythology that's not from the part of the world that I was in, which of course is great. You get to learn about, you know, a part of the world that you're not living in. But at the same time, like for me, growing, you know, making work now, I'm excited about this fact that young people will see this work that, uh, you know, Ansi's producing, Jen's producing, uh, and and Aoife, I'm sure you represent a lot of artists that uh, that do that kind of work too. And they'll see this work and they'll look at it and see that, oh, you know, this story is actually inspired by an indigenous South African mythology or story or or literary work that, you know that they can actually be proud of and and actually go very deep into and that inspires the next generation of, of artists as well of course so i think i'm very interested in keeping that uh that torch alive so that <laughs> it's it's sort of the engine that inspires me to keep making work at this point because um yeah i would look i very much love for that kind of sensibility for a young nigerian person to grow up with and, and that's all uh well, Shafili, you, you kind of uh, segued into how I wanted to wrap wrap things up and just to go around the room was, you know, th that torch and what uh, what hope there is for people wanting to come into the industry. So I just want to go around the room quickly and, you know, starting with Jenna, uh, just in terms of uh, what you can say to any person. They can be in their fifties, starting out. They can be uh, coming out of school. They can be in school. You know what? What do you and, and you uh, yourself have uh, shot something award-winning on a shoestring? Um, so there's no limits, really. Uh, anything you want to just add to to anybody out there? Um, yeah, uh, I actually um, feel like feel like I'm stealing it because I feel like Onyeka already said it a little bit earlier, um, but um, before he left. But um, I think the the thing I would say is like, don't wait for permission. Um, like, I think a lot of young people or just people starting out, as you say, like whatever age, are kind of waiting for the kind of uh, the thumbs up or the affirmation or the best camera or the best deal or you know something it before they can tell their story or feel like their their voice is worthy of being heard and i think a lot of us waste a lot of time which we could be spending getting better at what we do waiting for that affirmation or for that permission um and so i mean i think a lot of people here you know on on this panel already are people who have kind of gone and just done things um and sometimes you know it's it's easier said than done I think a lot of people you know like you know I feel like I've had to kind of overcome a lot of things myself and I've had like a lot less obstacles than a lot of other people but I think just that decision to not wait any longer is like a big kind of mental hurdle to get over um and so I think that's like the best advice I can give like obviously listen to advice obviously take as much feedback as you can and ask questions but at the end of the day if like there's no one there who's saying just go for it like you kind of have to say that to yourself and let yourself do it cool uh anthony uh i know you're also yeah. uh on the lookout for for projects yeah. and and uh that kind of thing so anything yeah. you can say to them yeah i mean i think i totally totally agree with everything jenna said um just go for it you know I think what you have special is you as like no one else can can tell your story so um no one's gonna do it for you you gotta do it yourself um but saying that I do think the other factor is collaboration right find the right partner like part of the reason Triggerfish is successful is because they're five partners and we all are trying 
like all the time to try and make this thing a success. We're all working together with the same aim. My co-writer, Raffaella, we did Kumba together. We did Pull of the Sea together. Like I wouldn't have been able to do it alone. I think having that champion next to you as well, who's aligned, really helps because um, it's hard to do it by yourself. Like as much as you should just do it, it, it's really helpful to have other people who can come on board the same, um, yeah, same goal. And so finding the right partner from producer, like, you know, get get that champion who's going to help you execute the project because coming up with ideas is one, just one part of it, but then it's going to take 10 years before it reaches screen. Um, so yeah, right partners. Great. Aoife, your point of view. So I have two bits of advice. So the first one is to read a lot. So if you want to write scripts, read scripts, read a hundred scripts before you start writing well you can write but read 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 and if you want to write, write comics read comics and if you want to read books read everything just read 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 and you'll find that your writing gets better the more you read and the other thing i would say is just lean into your uniqueness don't try and second guess what other people are looking for or what's going to sell just really lean into what went like anthony said you, only you are you so really lean into that because we're all looking for something a little bit different we're not looking for more of the same you so, so read and be cool um uh, uh, shafela just lastly with you i know you touched on it a bit but uh I mean, essentially, uh, a pen and paper for illustrating and writing is all you need. So, yeah, any kind of advice that you can give? Yeah, no, uh, I think I think I probably said all I, I wanted to say about that. Um, but I think to add to that, I would tell a young person or persons just starting out, whether they're young or not, um, just don't be ashamed to, uh, like Aoife said, read as much as you can about um, the place that you're from. You know, the project I just worked on with with Anthony, um, one of the big inspirations for me for it was, you know, a poem that Wale Shoinka wrote about the Danre Hills. Um, and, you know, my experience of that landscape as well and wanting to show the beauty of that in an animated piece, you know. So, you know, there's a lot of wonderful things in the world, but also there's a lot of really pertinent things close to home that will mean a lot to you and try and lean into that stuff um, because it's essentially your touchstone and what you'll always go back to in your life um, and probably what will give you the most joy when you create so don't be if don't be ashamed of it just because the world tells you that you know your language sounds weird or you look weird or whatever um, yeah i would say that probably fantastic Okay, well, uh, yeah, that's been a pretty substantial session. Um, I know Sarah Bell will take over just at the end, but uh, yeah, just to thank you guys uh, for being here. Um, it was a really interesting conversation. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Catalyst Press and the James Curry Society for organizing this. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, yeah, just uh, look out for the other events that are, are being hosted. So yeah, thanks, Sarah Bell. Thanks, Thank guys. Uh, that was a yeah, wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you guys all for taking the time and, and um, lots of really interesting points there. So um, and thank you for all of our attendees and people watching after the fact. Um, it's Reading Africa Week, so make sure that you're taking part. You know, we've got a couple of different events, as Stephen mentioned. We've got um, one on children's literature on Saturday, same time, same place, actually. <laughs> um, but we're also going to be on social media all week long, our, all of our Catalyst press pages and lots of people have been interacting with the hashtags um so please definitely check it out um got lots of daily challenges and things like that as well um and thank you so much for to all the panelists um we've also got a, a really cool list on bookshop.org where we have listed all the you know the different creations of all these panelists um and from our other panels as well so hopefully everyone can check it out i'm not sure i saw jessica just popped up on screen if you want to say a few things i just wanted to say thank you thank you so much from a catalyst press um for joining us Absolutely, guys. Thanks so much. I'm going to go ahead and end this. Um, I hope everyone has a great rest of the afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Uh, yeah, thanks so much.